When our sons were in high school, one of them might have just started college, we um, took a trip out west to visit my family. My, all, my parents and my two sisters at the time lived in three different states. And so we met in Utah. It was kind of the, the center point. But more than that, it has some of the best hiking in the United States. And it's well known for the five big national parks uh, that are uh, beautiful and truly b breathtaking. And so the boys and I, over those two years, were uh, able to visit all five of the national parks. And uh, just want to show you a video that Utah put out that gives you a picture of what we saw. This is Zion, probably our favorite uh, huge views. That view, we saw that, and just amazing all around. Bryce Canyon, also beautiful, very unusual. No horses, no mules for us. Uh, we went old-fashioned and hiked. Uh, I guess they think they need to make it more exciting. Capitol Reef, to be truthful, was our least favorite of the five. It was fine, beautiful compared to most things, but uh, not compared to the rest of Utah. Canyonlands, that view. Unfortunately, here they're going to show us biking. I, I wish they would show you. It's like a mini Grand Canyon. When you look over the cliffs, it just, again, looked like the Grand Canyon. And then arches, uh, probably the other big well-known one, and uh, arches all over the place. Smaller ones like this. And then there's the big one. This is the one everyone knows. It's the one that people love and uh, truly is stunning. Here on the right, they put the arch superimposed to some of the other parks. Uh, really, truly beautiful. Uh, just the video doesn't do it justice. Normally, you know, typically commercials are like, you know, you get the real thing. You know, like kids. Remember as kids, like commercials, oh, I have to have that. That would be amazing. And then you get it, and after like an hour, you're like, this is boring. Well, those do not do credit to just how gorgeous uh, it really was. Um, it, it just was stunning to be there. Now, I will say that that arch on the right that you saw, like, they, they come and there's six people out there in front of the arch. Uh, that, that's about, if you multiply by about 50, that would be the number of people. About 300 when we got there. Like, if you want to take a picture, it's literally like crowds of people. There are kids running around. Not quite that. Um, but again, overall, this can't do justice. Like Zion, when you got up to the top of the hike and you looked out, it, it was truly breathtaking. It was a tough hike. It was a, what they call a switchback. So going up a mountain, often even if you're driving, what they do is they go back and forth because and, you can't go straight up. So it was just, I'm not kidding, probably 50, 60 switchbacks that are each longer than this room and moderately steep, and it was just brutal. Like it was no fun hiking. But once you got up there, it was just awe-inspiring. I mean, you just could not believe the beauty that God had created. Well, this weekend I went hiking in the Wachong Mountains in Warren for the first time in six weeks. It's one of my favorite places to go. January, cold and wet. February was the same way. And so um, the trails were no good and just uh, trails stay muddy. Matter of fact, I went this weekend. The trails were still muddy in many places, still ice in my, many spots. Uh, but it was so great just to get out again. Did 7.2 miles, and it just felt good to be back there. So I just want to show you, this was uh, something I took. It's a little stream that I was walking along, and um, just, you can't tell. It's a little waterfall after little fall, waterfall after little waterfall, and just the trees, there's uh, mountains off to the side, and uh, just really was so wonderful to be back in it. But as you look at that, that's not as impressive as Zion, right? Especially when I finish, I didn't realize when I'm doing it, you know, you're just kind of panning. And then at the end, I'm like, yeah, I picked all the dead trees that they had to kind of <laughs> cut to let the trail go through. Um, and I'll be truthful, this does not compare to Zion National Park. It does not compare to arches. Um, and yet it was beautiful. Standing by that stream, or later on by the river you see in the middle there, seeing the sunset that is to the right, uh, just, again, I was like, thank you, God, for your glory, for your goodness, for the beauty of what you've created. The problem is, to you seeing, you know, the pictures, okay, those are nice, the video is like, eh. But, but when you're there, it's a different experience. If you could have heard the babbling brook surrounding me, if you could have felt the gentle breeze, the smell of the leaves, the sight of that tiny little waterfalls as they went down. They all combined to reveal God's glory. This just doesn't do it justice. And you know, our problem when we think about heaven is, it's like watching the Utah commercial. It's better than what the commercial shows, but the commercial cannot help you feel what it's like to be standing on this mountain and you are looking out and just 
everywhere beauty around you. And so the glimpses we have of heaven are just so small. They give us a taste, but we can't experience it. That hike, you're probably looking at that stream going like, ah, big deal. It really was beautiful that day because of all that surrounded me. And so this morning, I want us to give us a glimpse of heaven found in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. And here we get a little picture of what heaven will be like because we are called to worship God. It's not something we're asked to do. It's a command that we're to give him glory, that we should live our lives for him. And if we saw the reality of heaven and how amazing it is and truly understood it, it would change our lives. We can read about John's experience, but I guarantee John was never the same after he saw this with his own eyes, after he heard it and smelled and touched. So this morning, I want us to just give us a glimpse. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, the Apostle John writes, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And at once I was in the spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And Dave, you can go ahead and flip on that. I'm done with videos. You know, Yogi Berra once said, you can observe a lot by watching. Um, he was famous for saying obvious things. You can observe a lot by watching, and it's true. John does that. As we study this chapter, we find God's glory is seen throughout. His holiness is evident. Now, throne is used repeatedly in this chapter, 14 times. And thrones carried the idea of supremacy, of authority. They were reserved for important people, for powerful people. Average people don't get to sit on thrones. They get chairs, like what you're sitting in. Now, I, I would like to point out to you that growing up, my church had up front, up on the podium, it was a traditional United Methodist church, two huge chairs. Remember those kinds of you grew up in maybe traditional churches, like that tall, you know, like big wood backs, that wide, no little narrow chair, you have a wide chair, thick red uh, cushion. Man, that pastor, you know what I have to do when I have to sit down here? I get a folding metal chair like the rest of you. That's discouraging. But the truth is, no one deserves a throne. Not even kings or queens deserve thrones. Only God, the supreme one, the Father, Son, and Spirit is worthy of the throne. Well, verse 3. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Jasper is a clear gem. Rubies are beautiful red gems. Now, the rainbow here encircles the, th the throne. So we normally think of a rainbow, it's an arch. But this goes completely around the throne. And, you know, rainbows are stunning. Like any time, if you're out and there's a truly, you know, sometimes you can barely see them, but pretty much everyone stops when there's a, a strong, really beautiful rainbow. And so imagine this, it's encircling the throne. And it's shown like an emerald. It's beautiful. Verse 4. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones. And seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. So these elders are like the king's court. We're not exactly sure what they represented or who they are. Some argue it's the 12 apostles along with the 12 patriarchs. Those whose names would be given to the tribes of Israel. Others say that they represent the people of God. They're just a representation of, of us. Others say that they are angelic beings. Uh, what we know for sure is that they are there to glorify and worship God. They wear white robes, white symbolizing purity. They have crowns of gold on their head. Gold has been refined and is pure. Crowns, again, are the idea of you're someone important. And so they have those. Verse 5. From the throne came flashes of lightning rumblings and peals of thunder in front of the throne seven lamps were blazing these are the seven spirits of god also in front of the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass clear as crystal so there's lightning there's rumbling there's thunder these are all pictures of god's power when god speaks the world shakes his voice isn't just nice and deep it's not like a james earl jones as darth vader you do not yet know the power of the dark side. You know, he's got that deep voice. I love his voice. You know, you think about Gandalf from 
Lord of the Rings, you shall not pass. Oh, that's a great voice, too. I love that voice. Carson, for those of you who watch Downton Abbey, the, the butler who is just way too full of himself, he talks like this, Mr. Mosley, you need to take the chafing dish now. Well, God's voice isn't just deep. It's powerful. It's thunderous. It rumbles. The world shakes when God speaks. Verse 5, there were seven lamps, which we're told are the seven spirits of God. Now, if you're a part of Glenn's uh, Bible study on the book of Revelation a year and a half ago, uh, I really appreciate it. And I said to Glenn, it's amazing how often, like, theologically we agree almost across the board. And, and when he would say these different things and explain what things meant, he kept saying the same thing over and over. Scholars think it might mean this, or it might mean this, or it might mean this. You know, and they'd say, well, I think it's maybe this. But he's like, I could be wrong. Because a lot of revelation we don't know. So if you're like, well, Mike, Mark, why can't you definitively tell me? Because a lot of it we don't know. And so there are pastors who will simply tell you, my view is the right view. Um, well, my view is the right view. Um, no, it is. It is. But, but I'll tell you my, the right view is that we don't know for sure. But seven, we know, is the number of perfection in the Bible. Whenever you see seven and you see it repeatedly here, it's this idea of completeness, of perfect. And then there's the seven lamps. And so God is the light and also the seven spirits of God. Scholars believe this is the Holy Spirit in completeness. In other words, seven, again, symbolizes everything, all, complete. Verse 6, it looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. So it's not saying this is a sea of glass. I've seen like surfers wear t-shirts, like Christian surfers about, you know, in heaven, we'll be surfing on a sea of glass, you know, how would that work? Um, it's like glass. It says it's like crystal. So the idea is it's refracting and just glorifying God even more, the colors bouncing off of it, the beauty all around. So John's trying to explain the visual phenomena that he's seeing. This crystal surface stretches out before the throne. It's reflecting, refracting. And it created in John an unspeakable heightened sense of the majesty of who God is. John uses ideas here, jewels, rainbow, thunder, lightning, sea of glass, to try to help explain to us what is unexplainable. No language possesses words beautiful enough to describe the glory and majesty of God. When I tell you what it's like in Zion, you can kind of go like, oh, I bet that's nice, but if you've never experienced it, you don't know. You just can't. If you do not have taste buds, I'll never be able to explain to you what Deb's blueberry pie tastes like. It's amazing. Like when she makes that, I'm just, wow. Whenever she does that for her husband, I love, it's just such a beautiful thing. Like it's a way that, you know, like if Valentine's Day were coming, like that's the kind of thing that, oh, by the way, actually I mentioned that for the guys who are like, oh, the truth is Deb and I, she calls it a Hallmark holiday. I agree. It's no big deal to us. So honey, you don't have to make me a blueberry pie unless you wanted, to, <laughs> unless you wanted to do that for me. But truthfully, I could never explain to someone the same way that I could not explain the sunset that I saw this weekend to someone who's been blind all their life. I could try, but they're never going to really understand. One pastor said, I often use the illustration of when you find a young guy who's fallen head over heels in love. And you say to him, how's your relationship going? And he says, well, uh, it's a, oh boy, gee, it's, it's, a, it's, it's so... Uh, and he stutters and stumbles, and it seems like he can't explain it, and he can't, because it goes beyond his words. I mean, imagine for Deb, when we were dating, try to picture how difficult it was when her friend said, what's Mark like? And she was just, oh. you know, the words, just, you know, I'm sure she wanted to talk about how handsome I was, how amazing, you know, what a great, and then I think, you know, the thing, obviously, the biggest piece was the humility. That's just part of who I am. And uh, the, no, the truth is, I, I, was, I, I looked okay. I, looked, I had hair. I was thin. I looked better, but um, I didn't want any awards. But there are times words don't explain what we're feeling, what we're seeing. And the biblical writers, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, were given this task of using linguistic tools, the words that we have to try to explain. I remember hearing one of my professors in seminary talking about as a missionary in Indonesia back in like the, the 40s, early 50s, trying to explain in Papua New Guinea, places literally where they were the cannibals, where it was all the stuff you've seen. When he'd talk about as white as snow, our sins that are scarlet will be as white as snow. Well, 
They've never seen snow. How do you explain that? In the same way, the biblical writers are using images that we can understand, but, but just know the picture we have is so incomplete because we just can't grasp the grandeur of God. Using our poor human language just will never be enough. Verse 6 continues. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was, fly, was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So these living creatures seem to be the worship leaders. Now they have eyes all over them, we're told even underneath their wings. And this seems to suggest alertness, knowledge that they saw all things. Nothing could escape their notice. They also have six wings, which scholars suggest may mean swiftness to carry out God's work. We're told they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. They keep saying this over and over. Here's the thing. If someone tells you you look good, what do you say? Well, thank you. I've not experienced that in many years, but if, if someone said it, you know, I'd be like, oh, thank you. And if they say, wow, you look really good, you go like, wow, really? Thanks. I, I appreciate that. But if they say, wow, you look really, really, really good. Then you either go, oh, wow, that's so nice. Or you're like, you're a creep and I'm getting away from you, right? It's, it's one or the other, depending on who the person is. In the Bible, when words are emphasized and repeated, that's one of the ways that the ancient Hebrews did to, to make something important. So to say holy, holy, that's like, yeah, okay, it's not just holy. God is really holy. But it's holy, 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 like supremely holy above all things. His glory is seen through his holiness. Well, verse 9, whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So here are these 24 elders, whoever they are, fall down and they begin to worship. Now they themselves are seated on thrones. They are exalted. And yet, compared to God, they are nothing. And so they fall down. And they lay their crowns, as we just sang, you know, at the feet of the Father, at the feet of Jesus, they realize compared to God, they are nothing. These crowns that show that they're important, they are nothing compared to God's glory. And they say, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power. They recognize the majesty of God. He is like no other. He alone is the God of gods. In Heart to Heart, Ellen Yinger writes this. She says, my daughter lost her last baby tooth. By the way, I forgot to mention junior church. I just want to... Okay, yeah, I can say this. Okay. Uh, I, I shared a story like this years ago and got in trouble. So uh, you'll see why. Um, so she says, when my daughter lost her first baby tooth, I was weary of the tooth fairy and decided it was time to dispel the myth. Kelly, I said, you know how the Easter bunny is really mommy. Yes, Kelly replied a bit warily. And that's the kind of thing I got in trouble for years ago. Like, what? You wrecked my kid's idea. Um, <laughs> The mother then says, well, there's another person who is really me. Can you guess who that person is? And she said her eyes got as big as saucers and her daughter's mouth dropped. And she said, God? <laughs> well, to a little kid, the power of a parent is almost godlike, but God's power is infinite. It knows no end. So chapter 4 reminds us we're to worship this holy, holy, holy God who is worthy and is full of power and beauty and majesty. In chapter 5, we realize we need to also worship God because of his goodness and his grace. Verse 1 of chapter 5. 
Then I saw on the right hand of him who sits on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. The scroll represents the future, and so we're reminded God literally holds the future in his hands. You don't have to fear because God is in charge. Now, we're told there was writing on both sides of the scrolls. This would have been unusual in ancient times for a scroll that was so important. You know, if you're just basic things, you could write on both sides. Scrolls were difficult to come by, expensive. You know, you'd use every inch of it if you needed. But this is an important document. It seems to seem, it basically says, it says it's all covered. So the idea is this, that all that can be said has been said. This encapsulates everything. There's no more to be added. All that God has to say is right there. It's written, complete, final. Ancient scrolls were often sealed with blobs of wax, and then you would use your signet ring if you were wealthy and important, and you would have a ring made that would be yours alone. There would be none other exactly like it, and you would press that ring into the blob, and it would then show that, so when someone got it, they would know this was yours, and also the the wax would seal it, so it would make it difficult for someone to open it and change it in any way. Matter of fact, Roman wills, were sealed with six of these blobs of wax, but here seven, and God's not just upstaging the Romans. Seven again, that number of perfection, completeness, that it is sealed in such a way it cannot just be opened by anyone. Verse two, and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside of it. Not those four living creatures, not the 24 elders, not the angelic host. No one on this earth, not the apostles, not the prophets, not the pastors or the lay people, not the devil or his demons, even under the earth, none could open it. So John weeps because it seems that he will not be able to find out that what is in this scroll? What is it that God has planned? But he's told not to cry. Why? Because the lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed. Verse 4. I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or to look inside of it. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. The Lamb of God the lion. Because that's what's so amazing. I love this passage because the lion of the tribe of Judah, we're told in this verse, look, he can open it. And then he looks and in verse six says, then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So he looks and he sees not this lion of the tribe of Judah, but a lamb that looks like it's been slain. This, of course, portrays the sacrificial death of Christ. And also the fact that he was the Old Testament Passover. Here, John joins this Old Testament imagery, the mighty king, the lion, with the suffering servant of Isaiah. Now, if an artist tried to draw this image of the lamb, it would be grotesque. It looks like it's been slain. It's got has all these thorns, all these, uh, uh, all these horns. It would look very strange, but this is a spiritual truth. The lamb looks like it's been slain because Jesus died and poured out his blood for us. In just a little bit, we'll be taking communion together with a reminder that the blood of the lamb was poured out for his children. Verse 6 tells us the lamb had seven horns and seven eyes. Again, seven, that number of perfection. The horns were the way a lamb would protect itself. Eyes, again, this idea that God sees everything. Seven spirits of God are sent out to all the earth. Well, then we come to verse 8. And when he had taken it, that is the lamb had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain 
And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign with you on earth. So in chapter 4, these heavenly beings are worshiping God, saying, you are worthy because you created all things. God is worshipped for his glory, his creative ability. Here in chapter 5, Jesus is worshipped for the sacrifice that he made. They sing, you are worthy because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased persons for God. This reminds us of God's grace. Although we deserve punishment, God offers mercy to those who receive Christ. Although we deserve to be eternally separated from God, he offers a way to know him through that lamb that was slain. The Lamb speaks of meekness, of innocence, purity, submission to sacrifice. You know, it's white, it's fluffy, it's soft. The Lion speaks of strength, of size, of grandeur, courage, untamed. Its huge golden mane speaks of its power. How paradoxical that both of these images are used for Christ within a matter of one sentence. Why? Because he's so perfectly encapsulated between the two. He's not just the gentle lamb. He is powerful and mighty. So we worship God because of his glory, but also because of his grace. John Piper writes this. By the way, great pastor, if you're looking for something to listen to online, wonderful preacher. He says, we admire Christ for his glory, but even more because his glory is mingled with humility. We admire him for his uncompromising justice, but even more, because it's tempered with mercy. We admire him for his majesty, but even more because it's majesty in meekness. And we admire him because he could still the storm, but even more because he refused to use that power to strike down the Samaritans with lightning, and he refused to use it to get himself off the cross. Theologians speak about God's transcendence and his imminence. Transcendence is he is so far above us. He is glorious and powerful. And if you go into cathedrals, especially in Europe, but even in New York City, there's a couple of them that are they're huge. And when you walk in, there's this feeling of awe that just naturally comes upon you the first time you enter one of these. They're huge. The ceilings are vaulted, beautiful uh, buttresses all over, stained glass that's just amazing. And they're always so quiet if a service is not happening. It's just these massive stone structures. And what you feel is awe. You feel like you should be quiet. You feel like talking above a whisper is is somehow sacrilegious. Churches like that are not places where you're going to go if you're like a hugger. You know, Gloria Solorzano would be miserable in one of those churches because the people there, you know, kind of if you like that kind of church, your, your style is more like, you know, God's out here and, you know, kind of, you know, stay away a little bit is the feeling you get. That's transcendence. And God is transcendent. He is someone who is so far above. We should be in awe of him. We should be amazed by him. He is mighty and powerful. But he also is close to us. And that's the theological word that's known as imminence. And that's that Jesus is near us. He's at work in our lives. It's characterized by the old hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. It's imminence that makes people say, "Like, man, God's my main man. Oh, I'm going to hang out with the Lord. Well, yeah, he loves us, and yes, he wants us to be close to him, but these two things need to be held in balance. Some people are so focused on God's transcendence, they do not realize he wants to be involved daily in their lives. They forget that the Holy Spirit has been placed in them so that God is with them. But then there are others that are so into, like, yeah, Jesus is with me. He's my bro. He is the King of Kings. Yes, he actually, through the blood of Christ, we are now brothers, but he's not someone you treat just like you treat your own siblings. He is, above all, the Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So we can't treat him like our pal because he's God. John Piper writes, God is an important person, and he does not like being taken for granted. Suppose you ask a man, a president of a company, who besides God is the most important person? person in your life. And he were to think and he were to say, be my vice president of marketing. You say, well, wait, aren't you married? It's not your wife? Oh, well, no, no, of course my wife. No, that was just assumed. 
yeah, I just assume that's the case. Now, a few people would give him the benefit of the doubt and just be like, yeah, I guess he so loves her that, you know, he just doesn't even need to mention that. But most of us would just say, wow, how pathetic that his vice president of marketing is who he sees as the next most important person in his life next to God. And he says the wife would not say, I'm so honored that I'm like the air you breathe. You never even need to give me a thought. He says she would say, if I don't come to your mind when you're asked about your life's priorities, then it's because I'm not important to you. He concludes by saying it's possible to take important things like oxygen for granted. And that's so often what we do to God. We just take him for granted. He's there when we need him and we can ignore him otherwise. When we, our lives start to fall apart, yeah, we run back. God, I'm sorry, Lord, I need you. Otherwise, we push him off to the side. This image that Revelation gives us is of a God who's so mighty and powerful and beautiful, our minds cannot comprehend. We cannot begin to understand. So this morning, I wonder, have you been ignoring him? Have you been treating him just like he's a buddy that you can talk to when you feel like it, pray when you, you know, or something I need? Speak with when you need his word to speak into your life because you have a decision, but otherwise you can ignore him. Because God's not okay with being ignored any more than a wife would be if her husband ignored her. So let me ask, have you been obeying God? Have you been doing what he calls you to do? Do you need to reevaluate your life today? Do you need to ask him to forgive you for forgetting about his glory? All of life, we're called to worship him. Not just Sunday morning, like, oh, I got that hour done. All of life should be worshiped. By worship, I don't just mean singing. Some people just make worship, that's it. Okay, I sang for 25 minutes, whew, that's over. Worship should be every day. I'm telling you, I was out in those woods, I was worshiping, because God made this. When something good happens, are you like, thank you, Lord? Deb all the time tells me she left her job at Rutgers. She's now in private practice as a counselor. She loves it, and she just always will be saying, Man, today I was just thanking God. Like, I get to do this for a living. I get to touch people's lives. and That's worship. The, when something good happens, you're just constantly thanking God. Revelation 4 and 5, they paint a picture of the majesty of our God, but also the love of the Lamb who was slain for us. Let's pray. Lord, this morning, I admit that so often we fail to realize how powerful and mighty and beautiful and holy you really are. God, we treat you like you're just someone that we know. Lord, forgive us for that. Forgive us for failing to realize how transcendent you really are. You are above all things. That these angelic beings would cry out to you. That these elders would fall off their thrones and lay their crowns before you, Lord, help us to do the same with our lives. That everything we have, everything we are, everything we do, Lord, that we would lay it at your feet each and every day. That we'd surrender to the work of your spirit in our life. And that we would confess our need for you. Jesus, I thank you that not only are you that powerful lion, but you also are that lamb that was slain for us. Your, your blood poured out for our forgiveness. And Jesus, we come to you also asking for that today. Lord, so often we fall short. We fail to follow you. Forgive us again, Jesus. I pray, Lord, for your power in our lives. I would ask that you'd open our eyes to see you in your glory, and that we'd honor you above all others. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.